Before I dive into this, uh, a quick offering thought. Uh, how many of you are doing the Bible reading plan with us? I see your hands if you're doing the Bible reading plan. Good for you. If you're not, you can pick up a journal and jump in any time. But if you're doing the plan, you would have read 2 Corinthians chapter 9 just a couple days ago. And verse 2, here's what it says. For uh, Paul, by the way, is writing to the Corinthians about an offering that he's receiving to take to the poor in Jerusalem. And uh, he says, for I know your eagerness to help and I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. And uh, the two words that jumped out at me were eagerness and enthusiasm. You know, those are not words that a lot of people attach to the offering. All right? Oh, we're going to take an offering. Woohoo! Yeah! And yet that was their attitude. And uh, the, a little bit later in verse 7, the same chapter, he says, uh, I don't want you to give reluctantly. I don't want you to give out of compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Add that word cheerful to eager and enthusiastic. And you say, why would people be eager, enthusiastic, and cheerful about giving? Well, when you read the rest of the chapter, he says, that whatever you give to God comes back to you multiplied times over. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. And when you realize how generous God is with you, you can't help but want to give back. So, lots of ways to give here at Life Center. They're on the screen. Thank you for your generosity. I hope it will be eager. I hope it will be enthusiastic and cheerful. Amen? Amen. All right. Good. So, um, Pastor Bryant's going to be sharing with us. Life Center is a church planting church. Most of you know this, but if you're new here, maybe you don't. And uh, we have been sending out churches uh, starting back in 1997. We have sent out, we have, we have 26 daughter, granddaughter, great granddaughter churches that we've sent out. Uh, 18 of them still going strong. Uh, not all of them made it. Uh, that happens, right? But we have 18 out there. Here's a really, really cool thing. On Easter Sunday, we had a new daughter church, a new granddaughter church, and a new great-granddaughter church, all on Easter Sunday. And uh, I'll just let me introduce them to you. City on a Hill in the Valley is a daughter church from Life Center, pastored by Sergey and Olga Suber. And uh, that was the daughter church. They had their grand opening on Easter Sunday. Journey Church in Nine Mile is a granddaughter church sent out of North Church, a daughter church from Life Center, pastored by Wayne and Cindy Ferris, pictured here with their daughter, Casey, who you also just saw a picture of her a moment ago, just graduated from Northwest Leadership College. And then uh, the Heights in Davenport uh, is a great-granddaughter church planted from the Heights in Airway Heights, which was planted from the North Church, which was planted from Life Center. Our first great-granddaughter church pastored by Anton and Shiloh Stout. And uh, I just thought that was kind of a cool day on Easter Sunday that we have a new daughter, a new granddaughter, a new great-granddaughter all on the same day. Well, we are, yeah, you can, you can applaud. That's pretty cool. So, as I said, we're a church planting church. It's what we do, and uh, we're going to keep doing that. And one of the ways we do that is each year we try to have a church planting resident. Think of it as finishing school for a church planter or a church planter intern. And this year's resident is Bryant and Stacy Hemphill. And uh, Bryant and Stacy are lifelong Spokane folks. Uh, who are planting Awaken Spokane in the Hilliard neighborhood. And I'm very excited about that, that we're going to plant in Hilliard. Uh, they're currently in the process of developing their core team. And in just a few moments when you hear Bryant preach, some of you are going to feel a little nudge in your heart that maybe God wants you to be part of this core team. So after the service, if that's you and you feel that nudge, Bryant and Stacy will be right down front here. Come see them and just have a conversation with them and uh, see if that's maybe what God's calling you to do to participate in this new church plan. More information, by the way, at Awaken Spokane, awakenspokane.com. All right, so three years ago, this is also on the church planting theme. Uh, three years ago, we helped to start a movement here in Spokane called the Pacific Northwest Church Planting Movement. Right now, more than two dozen churches of different denominations are all partnering together here in our community to plant more churches. And uh, we, in fact, we like to call ourselves Friends on Mission. And I love this, that we have all different kinds of churches working together to start new churches in our community. And uh, we also have churches from around the region, the Pacific Northwest, wanting to join us. And so our, our movement, our networks are growing rapidly. Well, just recently, a couple weeks ago, 17 of us 
went to New York City on a little field trip to learn from planters, pastors, and network leaders there. Uh, one of our instructors in New York uh, was Pastor Edwin Cologne, uh, who pastors a church in Brooklyn. And I think we have a pastor, uh, the picture, there he is. Hey, check out his socks. Huh? <laughs> By the way, I, I told him, I said, hey, we're kindred spirits, brothers. Check this out. You know, look at that. Huh? So, uh, but I did. I, I complimented him on his socks. But one of the things that Pastor Edwin said that I wrote down, it really struck me, was this. He said, I regularly tell my church, you are not just attending church. God is constructing a soul. I liked that. You're not just attending church. God is constructing a soul. Something bigger is going on. God is at work changing you, forming you to become more like Jesus. Let that sink in for a moment, because that means every time you show up here, every time you tune in online, God's at work doing something in your life, making you more like Christ. So we're talking today about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, John the Baptist compared the Holy Spirit to a fire. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who's coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John said that Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What does fire do? Well, of course, it burns, yeah. Okay, what else? It, okay, gives out light, gives out heat, it purifies or cleanses, it, it consumes. Thank you, Stacy. Yes. Yep, all these different things. Well, so I'm going to talk about the fact that fire purifies, cleanses, and prepares for new growth. And then Brian's going to come and talk with us about the fact that fire gives light and what that does. So the Holy Spirit works in these ways. And uh, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come and convict us of sin, that he would cleanse us of the chaff, the dross in our lives, and would make us clean and new. Here's a really interesting thing. I just learned this this week. Forest rangers have determined that many forests actually need regular fires to stay healthy. Otherwise, dense undergrowth accumulates and dead trees accumulate on the forest floor, which create bonfire conditions that result in destructive megafires. And an article in National Geographic put it this way. It said, periodic brief fires strip away the undergrowth and help new trees sprout, actually keeping these forests healthy. And when I read that, I thought about the fire of the Holy Spirit in our life that cleanses, right, that burns away the old crap that needs to be getting, gotten rid of, but also creates this new growth. So fire can be destructive, but the fire of the Holy Spirit is also constructive, clearing away the dead stuff and preparing the way for new growth. The Spirit not only burns, but builds. He takes away the old, and He builds the new in us. Jesus said, or John said that Jesus would come and baptize us with the Holy Spirit. And I want to just think about that for a moment. This word baptize literally uh, means to dip, to immerse, to plunge, to soak. And uh, in the Greek language, uh, at the time the New Testament was written, uh, there are some real interesting ways this word is used that, that uh, helps us understand the picture. So, for example, this word was used of a ship that had sunk to the bottom of the sea. That meant that the ship was not only fully in the sea, but that the sea was also in the ship. It was also used of a piece of cloth that had been immersed in a vat of dye so that it could soak up the color. So the cloth was not only in the dye, but now the dye is in the cloth. And then my favorite one, it was also used of a cucumber that was immersed in brine to make a pickle, right? And the cucumber is not only in the brine, but now the brine is in the cucumber. That's the word baptize. And the picture here is that when Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, he immerses us in the Holy Spirit so that we begin to soak up, take on the characteristics of the Spirit himself. When you're soaked in the Spirit, you're filled, you're changed. Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. Friends, we're literally pickled with Jesus. You take on the characteristics of what you're baptized in, whether it's the dye or the brine or the Holy Spirit. And this change is dramatically described 
in Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 16. I'll just read this, and then I'm going to pass the baton to Brian. Galatians 5, 16, Paul says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. All right, let's pause for just a moment. Paul's describing two different ways to live here. He says we can live by the Spirit, or we live by the flesh. And when Paul uses the word flesh, he's not talking about this stuff. He uses the word flesh in a very specific way. He's talking about human nature lived, uh, living a life apart from God, living a life independent of God. So in other words, to live in the flesh is for me just to live on my own without God. And to live in the Spirit is for me to live filled with, soaked in the Spirit, so that I'm taking on His life and characteristics. Those are the two op- uh, different things. Now, he goes on to describe what each of these produce, all right? First in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I'm warning you about these things as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. All right, so there's one list. That's an ugly list, isn't it? He says, hey, do you want to know what life looks like without God? Well, here it is. If you live on your own, this is what you end up producing. It's not a pretty list. But then he says, here's what you produce when you live in the Spirit. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's also keep in step with the Spirit. All right, two very dis- distinct and different lists, right? Yeah. Which one do you want? Okay, let's take a little vote here. How many of you say, yeah, I want to live over here on this side, right? All that bad stuff. Yeah, yeah, if your hands are up, I'm coming after you. All right, yeah. How many of you say, okay, I want to live over here on this side of the list, yeah? With, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's what, exactly. And how do we get here? Friends, here's the secret. You don't get over here. You don't have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. All qualities of Jesus. You don't develop the qualities of Jesus by just going out and trying harder. You develop them by yielding to the Holy Spirit and letting Him fill you. And as He fills you, as as you soak in Him, you begin to take on the characteristics of the one who's filling you. You become like, more like Jesus. God is not just having you attend church. God's constructing a soul. And this is what He's up to, friends, to make you more like Christ. And the way He wants to do it is by filling you with His Spirit. Pastor Brian's going to come and talk more about the light of the Spirit. Yeah, I put my water again. (laughs) Well, good morning, 9 a.m. We'll try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right, there we go. You've got to help me out here a little bit. I know it's early. I know Josh called you sinners before I got up here. So uh, let's, let's get the enthusiasm going, and uh, we'll have a good time up here. Sound good? All right, before we get started, go ahead and pass your Bibles, because I'm going to camp in two different areas today in the Scripture. Uh, you can go to John chapter 14, uh, page... 927, and then if you like, hold your place in Acts chapter 4, page 938. Um, Before I do get started, I I just want to say a big thank you to this house, because uh, as many of you don't know, and I know Pastor shared this just a minute ago, this is a a church planting church, and uh, I don't think people really understand how important that is, that you have a church that invests in growing the kingdom of God, especially in this region. This is not normal for most churches, okay? So Michael and his staff, they just do a phenomenal job of helping us out. Joe and I, we meet every week, and just under his leadership, they've made the experience of church planning go from very difficult to just difficult. (laughs) It's not easy, it's not easy, but, uh, you know, praise God. It's uh, with God's help and the Holy Spirit, man, we're going to get some things done up there in Hilliard. 
Um, I will say that uh, it's interesting, when we tell folks that we're starting a church up in Hilliard, most people's response are, well, what would you do that for? And uh, because I know it is a tougher area, but uh, we actually had one guy that says, well, if you're starting a church up there, I'm not going to your church. And I said, well, we don't want you up there anyway then. No. (laughs) I I didn't say that. I was thinking it, but I didn't say it. Okay. So I I will ask, well, why why do you say that? Why do you think it's, you know, going to be a rough area, you know, to go into? He said, well, it's going to be tough up there. And we get that. We understand that. You ain't telling us anything that's new. We know it's going to be tough up there. But the thing is, is this, anytime you're stepping out and doing something for Jesus, I'm going to break it to you. If you don't know this, it is going to be tough. Okay? It is going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have some obstacles that you may not have experienced before. But we shouldn't be afraid by those obstacles. And and obviously and clearly, we should not be afraid by the darkness around us as well, because we're living in a world right now that is full of darkness. And Jesus wants us to be light in the midst of that darkness. Instead of living a life where the world around us changes what's in us, why don't we decide to change the world around us from within us? I'm going to preach over here. Someone's someone's excited over there. (laughs) I'm just going to stand over here the rest of the time. I'll share a quick story. I was was in Walmart here. This is a couple, two, three weeks ago. And me and my daughter were going into Walmart, and I had to uh, get some accessories for my Instapot. (laughs) Don't laugh, because Instapot is one of the greatest things. I I told uh, last night... uh, service, I said it replaced dog as man's best friend. It is, it is just great. My wife will say, well, honey, what are you cooking for dinner? I don't know, chicken. Well, how, how are you making that? I don't know. I just threw it in the Instant Pot, threw a bunch of seasoning in there, and it just, it works. It works. So we were in there going to get some accessories for my Instant Pot, and as we were walking out, we see this guy in the customer service line holding his arm. And so I leaned down to my daughter. I said, see that guy right there? We're going to go pray for him as we're walking out. And so as we were walking out, I, I stopped him. I said, hey, man, what's going on? And, he, you know, hey, what's going on with your arm? And he's telling me it just hurt and stuff. I said, well, I'm going to pray for you. And when I do, you're going to feel something in there, and the Lord Jesus is going to heal you. Oh, pray for me. He said, pray for me. So I prayed for him, and nothing happened. <laughs> and so I walked away just a little, in, you know, like frustrated with that. And I shared Jesus with him and how much Jesus loves him. But I'm frustrated that his arm wasn't healed. You know, I stepped up and I said, this is what's going to happen. And so I walked away from that. And so, like I said, I was a little frustrated with that, but I think sometimes we've all been in these situations where we prayed over something and we didn't see the results that we liked and we didn't see the results that we wanted. And at that point, when we feel like our light has has not shined in the darkness, then we get intimidated and we get fearful of stepping out going forward. The challenges, listen, the challenges that we have as Christians is to not allow the darkness to leave its fingerprint and impression upon us. Instead, we need to leave our fingerprint and impression on the darkness. We shouldn't be afraid of that. We should run to it. Okay? And let me explain what it really means to, like, put your fingerprint on something. I, I worked for Verizon for 15 and a half years, and as I get into this story... That does not give you excuse to come, camera's not working right and all that stuff. We're not going to do that. We're not going to go there. I don't answer questions like that anymore. Okay. But I I was account manager, and so I manage roughly 12 to 15 locations for Verizon. And so these are companies that sold Verizon, but they they weren't owned by Verizon. So I would just go in and I would represent Verizon on behalf, you know, in the store, making sure they're doing everything right. So I would go in and coach and things like that and train and help sell and, you know, all that stuff. Well, one of the things that my boss would always say to us, he would say, when you go into a location, leave your fingerprint, leave your impression on that location. Because if I come in after one of your visits two to three hours later, it should be evident that you were there. It should be noticeable that you had been there and whatever you were doing. So... He would say this, and I want you to take note of this. He would say, when you go into a store, be intentional. Know why you are going up there. 
So I want you to be intentional. Regardless of what you're doing, know why you're going into that location. The second thing that he would say is recognize or understand your influence. Know that you've been backed by Verizon. You have the ability and capability of being a good trainer and coaching and things like that. So understand your influence. And lastly, he would say, change the business. Change the business for the better. And the thing is, is this, is as Christians, we need to adopt that same approach as well. We need to do the same. Listen, we need to leave our fingerprint and our impression on whatever we are putting our hand to for the name of the Lord. It should be evident wherever we go because we are placing our fingerprint on it. So regardless of what you're doing, you need to be intentional. You're not just going out for coffee. You're not just going to the gym. There's a reason why you are going to those places. There's always going to be an opportunity to share the gospel. Be intentional. The second thing is this, understand your influence. You have been backed by the authority of Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Know your influence. And then the last thing is change your world. Are you with me? Let's flip over. Oh, here in a second, we'll get there. But as we're wrapping up, we're going to just put a nice little bow on this series, Fresh Wind and Fresh Fire. And I was saying to the crew last night, I think this is a, a timely message for us right now. It is very, very timely that we understand the flow of the Holy Spirit in our life. And I think for me, the Holy Spirit is that one person in the Bible where I just absolutely love to talk about him. Because there is something about when somebody's life gets changed for Jesus. When the Holy Spirit's at work in yourself and the Holy Spirit's at work in someone else's life and it's evident and you can see that there is just something about it. There's just something about this gospel that I absolutely love. That I just can't get enough of this. I can't get enough of the Holy Spirit functioning and flowing and operating in our life. And I just absolutely love it. So I often wonder, list, I often wonder what is it going to look like when Christians begin to come to the true understanding of who we have living on the inside of us and how it can impact our world outside of us. Yeah. And that we've been given the honor and the privilege to take this gospel and to leave our fingerprint on this world and we can expect things to change. So the big idea of my portion of this message is this. The life of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us will influence the world around us. Let's talk about that. So get over to John chapter 14, verse 15. And as I read this, let this sink in here. Jesus speaking to the disciples here, and this is really the... First time he's beginning to talk to the disciples about the Holy Spirit intimately, okay? He's kind of starting to introduce them to what's about to come. So he says this in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and he will be in you. Three key takeaways that I get from the scripture. Jesus said that he is going to give you another advocate. That word advocate is counselor, helper, comforter. So he's going to give you another advocate. What that tells me when he uses that word another, that he is going to give you somebody of the same sort. What I have been to you, the Holy Spirit is going to be, you, be unto you as well. Everything I am is everything he's going to be. I am giving you another helper, another comforter, another counselor. The second key takeaway is this. He says, he will never leave you. The third takeaway is this. He said, he's been amongst you, so you, you already know him, but now he's going to be in you. See, up until this point, Jesus was the only individual 
walking on the face of the earth who had the Holy Spirit within him. The disciples were experienced with seeing the Holy Spirit amongst them, but never within them. So when Jesus walked this earth with the Holy Spirit within them, and they seen the results that he was getting as a man here on earth full of the Holy Spirit, you got to understand that there was some anticipation building up within their heart about what's to come. Are you following me? They realize what's about to happen, and they are going to understand that they're going to be able to operate and to function with the Holy Spirit just like Jesus. So to say these guys were not excited and anticipating this moment would be a complete understatement. Because they know what's about to come, and they're about ready for it. And so as Jesus gets to this point, and we talked about this last week, Pastor Michael talked about this last week, in Acts chapter 8, when Jesus, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That word power right there is the Greek word dunamis. We get our word dynamite from it. So when the Holy Spirit gets ready to come, he's saying he will give you dunamis. That word power is, is, a, is a word that's described as great power. Not only power that impacts you, but power that's going to impact everything around you. So right here when he says this, the disciples are like, sign me up, I want that, that seals the deal for me. Because you're about to give me some power. So in Acts chapter two, verse two, when the Holy Spirit comes in like a rushing mighty wind, and don't get this wrong, it is not some weak wind that just blows because they got both of the doors open in their house. No, it's not some weak wind. The Holy Spirit comes in like a rushing mighty wind. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, boom, these guys were filled with the life of Jesus on the inside of them. Their, their world, right as we know it, changed immediately. They went to a new normal. It was no longer we are just following the light of the world. It became we are now the light of the world. Amen. And if we are the light of the world, we better go find some darkness. And that's exactly what they did. They didn't run from darkness. They began to run to darkness. Because knowing that the light is living on the inside of them they started becoming intentional because they were aware of their influence. And they set out to change the world. And change the world is exactly what they did. So they went forth and began to go out, putting their fingerprint on everything that they touched. Signs, wonders, miracles. People coming to the church daily by the thousands. And not only that, were these people giving their lives to Jesus, then they went out and started doing the same thing. They put their fingerprint on, the, on their world. They began to duplicate and multiply. And so everyone was going out, putting their fingerprint on everything that they did because they knew they had the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. City after city, place after place, person after person, crippled people walking, blind eyes being opened, lives being restored. In Acts chapter 17, it actually referred, some of them referred to as these are the individuals that turn the world upside down. They changed their world. It wasn't a question if they would, they changed their world. In the midst of all this, they had their challenges, rejection, imprisonment, even death but they had plenty of opportunities to allow the darkness to leave its impression upon them, but it didn't stop their pursuits. There was no amount of darkness that could stand in their way because they had the life of the Holy Spirit within them and they knew it. So they continued on. Each place they visited, they left their fingerprint. This became their new normal. From here on out, this is the way it is. Some may say, well, Brian, that's because these guys had some extra advantage. You know, they had some special gifts. I mean, they walked with Jesus, and it's easy to sit there and say that. It's easy to come uh, to that. But before we come to that conclusion, let's take a look at the story in Acts chapter 4. 
So turn over page 938 for me. And to set this up for you, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are walking on the road there. They see a man, you've heard this story, but they see a man sitting at the gate called Beautiful. And he's begging. All right, guys, you got a dollar. I'll, t- I'll take a dime or a nickel, whatever. Just give me something. And Peter looks at him and says, listen, I don't have any money, but what I do have... I'm going to give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. So this man was healed. He got up. And so at this point, it just kind of set off a fire. And so they started preaching the gospel and they made their way into the temple, started preaching the gospel in the temple. But what this did is it fired up the religious leaders because they're preaching the gospel in the temple of this resurrected Jesus that they rejected earlier. So they start preaching this gospel. They arrest Peter and John. They pull them into the the council, the religious council, and they begin to ask them questions. They say, by what power are you doing these things? Well, Peter and John reply, this isn't our doing. This is nothing that we're doing. We are doing this by the name of Jesus. You know, that one you rejected? And let's pick it up in verse 13 over here, and let's take a look. The religious leaders said when they saw the courage of Peter and John and they, were, they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They are just ordinary men. They hadn't been to seminary. They don't have any special training. They're your bus drivers. They're your baristas. They're your stay-at-home moms, your stay-at-home dads. They're your average, ordinary individual. We are just ordinary men. Let's go down, jump down to verse 19. I want to show you this. You guys doing okay? All right. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes Well, at at this point, let me back up for a second. So the religious leaders were like, hey, listen, we can't explain what's going on. I mean, we've seen this guy. He was crippled. Now all of a sudden he's healed. We can't explain this. But I'll tell you what we're going to do. You can't preach Jesus from here on out anymore. And then we pick it up in verse 19, and this is what it says. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to listen to God? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. The question I'm putting out there is, what have they seen? Well, I'll tell you what, they've seen Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, operating and functioning with the Holy Spirit, seeing signs, wonders, miracles, people delivered. People set free. This is what they seen. So the other question is, what did they hear? Well, they heard Jesus say that I'm going to give you another comforter. I'm going to give you someone that's not going to leave you. I'm going to give you someone that is going to be within you. And on top of that, I'm going to give you power to be my witness. That's what they seen, and that's what they heard. We can't stop talking about it. So there was no extra advantage that they had. They just simply believed what they'd seen and what they'd heard. Jesus, you were full of the Holy Spirit. I saw what you did. You said I was going to receive power by the Holy Spirit. I I heard that too. You also said that he's going to be in me and he's never going to leave me. Ordinary people doing what they now classify as ordinary things. The same Jesus... Same Jesus that they see, we see. We see the same Jesus sitting in that Bible on your lap. The same word he spoke to them, he still speaks to us. The same Holy Spirit living in them now lives in us. The same results they expected, we can expect. The biggest hindrance, listen to me guys, the biggest hindrance for us flowing in the Holy Spirit is not that I can't speak well, it's not that I'm not educated, or I can't quote scripture, or it's not that I'm not a pastor, or it's not that I'm up here on stage preaching the gospel. The biggest hindrance for us being the light and flowing with the Holy Spirit is us. 
We try and figure out the impossibilities with everything up here instead of operating from God's possibilities in here. Amen. We don't lack power. Listen, guys, we don't lack power. We lack an awareness of the power. Let me say that again. We don't lack power. We have everything that we need to be the witness of Jesus Christ, to represent him and to represent him. So we don't lack power, we lack an awareness of the power. Let me share this story with you real fast and, and we'll kind of wrap things up here. So not long ago, I was playing basketball, right before staff meeting here, I was playing basketball with some of the NWLC kids. Uh, there's a basketball hoop out there. And so we were gonna play two on two. And there was, uh, there was one young man out there that wasn't very skilled in basketball, kind of played basketball like my son and his friend down there. But uh, <laughs> he wasn't very skilled in basketball, okay? Uh, you know, out there traveling and dribbling, you know, it just, yeah. Uh, he needed work on his jump shot. He needed work on his passing. And he really needed work on just recognizing what a basketball was, okay? <laughs> just, and yeah, I talked to him about this. He's okay with me telling the story, but so. <laughs> So say if I had this special ability in me and I pull him aside and I said, listen, man, I know, I know you're not very good in basketball, but this is what I'm going to do. Now, you remember two weeks ago when Michael talked about uh, Clay Thompson and how Clay Thompson scored 37 points in one quarter, the, the most any NBA, NBA player has ever done in the history of the NBA. Clay Thompson, who's all NBA defensive team. So he talks about Clay Thompson and how just a phenomenal basketball player. I mean, 37 points in a quarter, I've never even done that on PlayStation or Xbox, okay? Phenomenal. So what if I pull this young man aside and I say, hey, listen, I know you're not very good at basketball, but what I, I have this ability, I have this talent that I'm going to endue you with power, infuse you with power, with the talent and the ability of Clay Thompson. Okay, so now all of a sudden he has different ability within him. Do you think he's going to go back out on that court and play the same game that he played before? Absolutely not. Because his confidence is going to be at another level. His confidence is going to be through the roof. Yes, he's still going to have to practice. He's still going to have to be doing, uh, you know, the fundamentals of the game. But you know what? He's going to be going and trying to get shots that he wasn't going to take before. He's going to be playing defense on another level that he never played before. Why? Because he knows what's on the inside is a different ability. Amen. Listen to me, guys. We have to know what's on the inside is a different ability. Get in the game, so to speak. Because there's something different on the inside of us. Now, back to my Walmart story. So as I left, completely frustrated... I get in the car, I get my daughter buckled in, and I see this guy walking in the parking lot. And I said, hey, John, come over here real quick, because I'm not happy about we prayed and nothing happened. I said, I'm praying for you again. Jesus prayed for someone twice, I'm praying for you again. So I prayed for him, I said, listen, when I pray for you, you're going to feel something in your arm something different. And so I put my hand on his arm and I started praying. He said, I just felt something. I said, well, what are you talking about? What do you feel? He said, my arm's feeling better. I said, well, what can you do that you couldn't? He said, I can move it. I can start moving this thing. I said, is that at 100%? No, probably about 50%. And so I prayed for him again and it wasn't 100% healed, but I said, 50%, I'll take that as a win. But the thing with it is, is this, is I know the power on the inside of me, and I'm going to continue to press forward until I see that on a regular, right? I'm going to keep myself in the game. I'm not going to allow that situation to intimidate me and, and, and intimidate me to step out and to pursue God. You want to see the move of God in your life? A lot of times we sit there and think that God is holding back and this nation is so dark and all we need is God to just move, God move, God move, God move. That'll change things, God, if you move. Listen to me, guys. If you want to see the move of God in your life and in this world, be the move. 
You have him on the inside of you, so be the move. Well, Brian, listen, what if I pray for someone and nothing happens? Well, what if you pray for someone and something happens? You ever thought about that? Think about that. Your capability to preach the gospel and be light in the dark places has absolutely nothing to do with your ability, but everything to do with your awareness of his ability living on the inside of you. You may just see yourself as ordinary, and that's okay, but don't be just your ordinary. Be God's ordinary. So back to my first statement. I know it's going to be tough up in Hilliard. I know things are, gonna, things are tough in this city. I know things are tough in this world right now. I know that darkness seems like it's abounding and it's, it's uh, taking over things. I know that. But listen, my wife and I, we've determined that we are going to put our fingerprint on that neighborhood. And the challenge that I'm putting out there to you guys as a church is put your fingerprint on this city. Because before this is all said and done and Jesus returns, I want him to be able to look at us up in that, that uh, community of Hilliard and say, these are the people that turn this neighborhood upside down. I'm gonna do you one better. I want people to look at this church and say, that's the church that turned this city upside down. <laughs> Understanding that we have the capability within us to do so. But Brian, what if you start a church up in Hilliard and it fails? Well, Brian, what if you start a church up in Hilliard and it doesn't fail? Think about that. Be intentional. Know that where you're going and why you're going up there, there will always be an opportunity to share Jesus, to preach the gospel. Know your influence. You're not backed by your ability, you're backed by an awareness of his ability. And lastly, change your world. The wonderful, wonderful Holy Spirit. He came in like the wind, but he wants to come out like a raging fire. Let's stand on our feet.